I'm Satan. I have a lot of records. This is Vinyl Monday. Oh jeez, I didn't think about cranberry juice and this coat and this carpet. We are playing with fire this week. So welcome back or welcome if this is your first time here. I'm Abby and Vinyl Monday is my series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds here on my channel, over on my Instagram, and on TikTok. So by my calculations, this is the 75th regular episode of Vinyl Monday, and we are celebrating a 55th anniversary today. It's not a big anniversary, I know, but I will never pass up the opportunity to dress like these absolute icons. It amazes me that this band is still at it over 60 years down the line having just released their first album of all original music in 18 years and they've just announced a tour. I don't know how they do it, but I sure am grateful that they're doing it. This week we're celebrating the 55th birthday of the Rolling Stones Beggar's Banquet. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls sometimes, make announcements for other things that I'm on that is not Vinyl Monday. <laughs> You can find that on my channel. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is one of two. This one is an early US repress from 68. This is denoted by some crediting mistakes that have been fixed. Uh, this is in stereo for those who are interested. I know we were still flirting with mono in 1968, but I don't know how many of those runs made it over to the States. My second copy is the most recent general sale run because I wanted one with this cover, didn't want to pay an arm and a leg for it, and it supported a store in Vermont. Let's talk about the toilet cover. The original Beggar's Banquet art was photographed by Barry Feinstein. Michael Voss came up with the concept. Barry and the Stones go out to some random Porsche dealership in LA and graffiti the walls. Highlights include God Rolls His Own, what, no paper? Beef jerky, sectioned, and what looks like the word marinated? I honestly can't tell. And my personal favorite, music from Big Brown. <laughs> this cover was submitted dangerously close to the Stones' deadline to hand the rest of the album in, which backfired spectacularly. Decca saw the image, went, we can't have a toilet on the cover, what were you knuckleheads thinking? And rejected it. Normally this would be a non-issue. It's just a wall, right? Wrong. The mamas and the papas went through a whole ordeal surrounding their very own toilet cover a couple years before. The album was recalled, caused a mess with sales, blah blah blah, however the stones we're not going down without a fight. World-class dirtbag Alan Klein, who was representing the Stones at the time, went head-to-head -head with Decca execs over this cover. The ensuing legal proceedings delayed Beggar's Banquet by at least four months. In the end, we got this dinner invitation cover instead, RSVP in the bottom corner and all, designed by Tom Wilkes. Now, does this cover look familiar at all to you? The blank background and the script, I'll give you a second. If you didn't come up with anything, Tom Wilkes designed Neil Young's Harvest cover a few years later. It's interesting to note the spectacular coincidence of this alternate art. The Beatles would release their own minimalist white cover just a few weeks before Beggars hit the shelf. But if you're buying a newer issue of Beggar, 
It's likely you'll have it with the toilet cover, like mine. The gatefold is the same on both of my copies. When we open it up, we see this photograph by Michael Joseph, taken at Sarum Chase, a mansion in Hampstead. Please forgive me if I pronounce that wrong. I am, after all, a dumb American. We have all the stones dining in style, but clearly no one bothered to remind Keefe of his table manners. He's got his feet up and his guitar at the table. Somebody's not getting his dessert. I believe if this was shot in monochrome, then recolored after the fact, that's how we get some of those browns, greens, and pinks. This was inspired by 19th century British art, or maybe a daguerreotype. This shot is epic, like a neoclassical history painting of all our favorite hooligans. Why they wouldn't just replace the toilet cover with this, I have no idea. It's a great shot. On Beggar's Banquet, we have the 60s era lineup of the Rolling Stones. We have Mick Jagger on vocals, harmonica, hand drum, and maracas. My baby darling sweetheart Keith Richards on guitar, some bass, and co-lead vocals on Salt of the Earth. Brian Jones on guitar, slide guitar, harmonica, mellotron, tempura, and sitar. Bill Wyman on bass, the double bass too, and shakers. And Charlie Watts on drums, tambourine, claves, and tabla. Our special guests include Nikki Hopkins on piano and farfisa. Dave Mason of Traffic on something called the Shanai. It's kind of like a recorder. Rick Gretsch of Family on the fiddle. Anita Pallenberg, Marianne Faithful, and Michael Cooper on backing vocals, or rather, on Sympathy for the Devil, and the Watts Street Gospel Choir providing backing vocals for Salt of the Earth. Beggar's Banquet was produced by Jimmy Miller, engineered by the real star of the Beatles Get Back, Glyn Johns. Roll transition. <laughs> Do I look properly disheveled enough? I hope I do. You gotta look disheveled enough to cover the Rolling Stones, man. Gives you a sense of authority. 1967 was a weird year to be a Rolling Stone. The year was marked by drug busts and the following legal trouble. Thanks in part to Donovan self-snitching on his song Sunny Good Street, Keith's home was raided for the first time in February of 67. Then Brian gets busted in October and put on probation. At the end of the year, the Stones put out... Oh, this is a real throwback. Their Satanic Majesty's Request. It's a brilliant album that clearly suffers from a lack of focus. In the time it took for the Stones to figure out what to do with themselves after Andrew Oldham quit, uh, for all their legal woes to settle, and the Sergeant Pepper's brouhaha to die down, Satanic Majesties seemed a little dated. Not to mention another much maligned spectacular album art coincidence, both Satanic Majesties and Sgt. Pepper's were photographed by Michael Cooper. The Stones had to learn the hard way that sometimes musicians are just not cut out to produce their own work. Enter one of the unsung heroes of Rolling Stones history, Jimmy Miller. Before this, he'd produced for the Spencer Davis Group and Spooky Tooth. Mick, Here's the traffic record Jimmy just produced, Dear Mr. Fantasy, and liked it a lot. He calls Jimmy up, confessed that the Stones had a bad experience producing themselves, and they found it overwhelming to have to be on both sides of the glass at once. Jimmy's a little starstruck, he's a huge fan, and jumps at the chance to produce the next album. According to Melody Maker in February of 69, Jimmy was only supposed to be in London for six six weeks. He ended up moving there. Gotta love being kidnapped by rock stars, am I right? I'm sorry, I can't concentrate. Rock stars have kidnapped my son. They did keep their engineer from Satanic Majesties around, though. Glyn Johns is here to stay, booked and busy through the next two or three years, all while being the best-dressed man in Britain. God bless that man, he is a gift to women like me. 1967 was also the beginning of founding member Brian Jones's 
downward spiral. As brilliant of a musician and creative force as he was, Brian was an unpredictable guy. Emotionally volatile is the best way to describe it. By 1968, his drug use was visibly exasperating his already erratic behavior. He'd expertly honed the skill of passive aggression. It was getting harder and harder to get him to show up for sessions. All of this is underscored by some pretty juicy interband conflict. While on vacation last summer, Keith swooped in and stole Brian's girl, actress and notorious party girl Anita Pallenberg. And now, Mick's making a film with her! Warner Brothers thought performance would be the Rolling Stones equivalent of a hard day's night. Instead, they got, well the Rolling Stones equivalent of a hard day's night. Complete with copious drugs, sex, alcohol, and violence. Through all of this nonsense, the Stones record Beggar's Banquet between March and July of 1968 at Olympic Studios in London and Sunset Sound in LA. The two studios I've mentioned the most on this channel. The Stones would spend all day at the studio, sometimes with Brian, sometimes without, sometimes with girlfriends, sometimes without, and make a rough cut or studio demo of a song. Then the next day, they'd run the tape back, pick out what they liked and what they didn't, and either refine the song or redo it entirely. The Stones were one of those groups that thrived in a studio environment. They used it as their playscape, as we see in... One plus one. This film is basically the Rolling Stones equivalent of Get Back, if only this could get the Get Back remastering treatment. If you're not at least a little sexually attracted to half-clothed Keith on bass, then you're probably a normal, well-adjusted person. You're doing way better than me, man. Ugh. Seeing Mick, Brian, and Keith jam out those changes is so cool if you're a big nerd about the studio process like me. It evolved into what we know the song as today, as the Stones added in more and more instruments and people. My god! Charlie looks so done with this. Oh hey, did I mention this thing was directed by Jean-Luc f***ing Godard? Through production and pre-production, Jimmy spent a lot of time with the Stones. It's important a band trusts a new-to-them producer, and that's exactly what they did. They got close, maybe a little too close. Jimmy became the man in the middle of the Glimmer Twins versus Brian conflict. He tried his best to play mediator, would just stick Brian in a booth by himself, to record whatever and splice him into songs as needed. Unfortunately, through Beggar's sessions, Brian transformed from asset to obstacle. When he did feel like showing up, he'd be way out of the loop and want to work on stuff the Stones recorded without him days ago. Then in May, he got busted for possession again. He's fined $1,100 in today's money and another $2,200 in court costs. The Stones may be one of the biggest bands in the world, but the studio isn't free. Everyone's schedules can't revolve around Brian, everyone's sick of walking on eggshells, Mick and Keith's patience was running out. But from Brian's point of view, right? Because I like looking at both sides of these arguments between big personalities and bands. The power dynamic was shifting out of his favor. This was his band, not Mick's. Aside from the occasional spat with the dandy divas, Jimmy said that working on Beggar's Banquet was, quote, very easy. Very smooth and lots of fun. The last song completed for the record was Salt of the Earth. They hit a roadblock with it early on, just couldn't figure out what direction they wanted to go with it, so they shelved it for a time, their logic being, once we have a better picture of what this thing is all about, we can make Salt of the Earth in its image. After a few months, Glynn runs it back, jogs the Stones' memories, and they come up with the album's grand finale a quiet tune built up into a big gospel finish. The track listing of Beggar's Banquet goes as follows. <laughs> 
upside one, we have sympathy for the devil, followed by no expectations. Next, dear doctor, then parachute woman, and side one closes with jigsaw puzzle. Opening up side two, we have street fighting man, followed by prodigal son? Prodigal? Prada? I don't know how to say that word. Then Stray Cat Blues. Next, Factory Girl, and the album closes with Salt of the Earth. Beggar's Banquet was released December 6th, 1968, 55 years ago this week. The promo single released in June, my favorite single the Stones ever put out, Jumpin' Jack Flash. It debuted at a surprise appearance at the NME Poll Winners Concert, their first public show in over a year. The encore was Satisfaction, Marianne and Anita were there, throwing flowers on stage. It was a welcome return to formula after the more adventurous Between the Buttons and Satanic Majesties music publications of the day were calling this the Stones' comeback, and it drummed up a good amount of hype for beggars, even more hype by the cover fiasco. Jumpin' Jack Flash was backed by the terribly underrated Child of the Moon, a leftover from the Satanic Majesty sessions. Fun fact, both of these songs were almost on the US version of Beggars. The album launch party was held at the Vesuvio nightclub in London. Paul McCartney brings a fresh acetate of Hey Jude as a congratulations gift, upstaging the Stones at their own album release party. Mick is royally pissed off. One Plus One premiered at the London Film Festival a week before Beggar's release. It was uh, similarly overshadowed by Jean-Luc Godard punching a producer in the face for changing the end of the movie. Then King of Rolling Stone magazine Jan Wenner wrote a glowing promotional review of Beggar's for the August 10th issue. He called Beggar's the formal end of all the pretend non-musical, boring, insignificant, self-conscious, and worthless stuff that has been tolerated during the past year in the absence of any standards set by the several great figures of rock and roll. <gasps> so basically he said the whole psych thing was garbage and he's glad it's over with. Of course, as I learned from the Wheels of Fire episode, if you hear what Jan had to say, you have to go back and find out what John Landau said and vice versa. John got to publish his review of Beggars on release release day, and this is what he said. The stones are constantly being reborn, but somehow the baby always looks like its parents. Landau saw the value in the stones' phases and occasional growing pains, but this was the thing that grabbed me. After describing a gig he went to in the suburbs of Boston that went sideways, knowing the suburbs of Boston, I understand how that happened, and he said this. Violence. The Rolling Stones are violence. Their music penetrates the raw nerve endings of their listeners and finds its way into the groove marked release of frustration. Their violence has always been a surrogate for the larger violence their audience is so obviously capable of. On Beggar's Banquet, the Stones try to come to terms with violence more explicitly than before, and in so doing are forced to take up the subject of politics. The result is the most sophisticated and meaningful statement we can expect to hear concerning the two themes violence, and politics that will probably dominate the rock of 1969. Son of a bitch! John Landau predicted the entire year! From the trials of the Chicago 7 to Woodstock to the goddamn Altamont Free Show! Accidental prophecies aside, this is one of the stronger Landau reviews that I've read. From his storytelling to ideas on protest songs, the Stones' mature and nuanced take on social commentary. Hold the fucking phone, did he just name drop the MC5? And to think a year later he would be producing their record. A week after Beggar's Banquet's release, on the night of December 11th, Michael Lindsay Hogg, the Rolling Stones, and all their famous friends descend on the Intertel studio to film a TV special. It would be called... The Rock and Roll Circus, and one of its goals was to promote Beggar's Banquet. A lot of stuff happened at this gig. For one, Brian was almost a no-show. Michael had to 
beg him to come, and this would end up being his last gig with the Stones. The bill was stacked. Jethro Tull, Taj Mahal, Marianne Faithful, and a literal actual circus. Now what do you get when you put a beetle, a rolling stone, an ex-yard bird, and a crochet sweater, and one-third of the Jimi Hendrix experience together? You get the greatest supergroup to never exist, the Dirty Mac. John Lennon, Keith Richards, Eric Clapton, and Mitch Mitchell got together for one night only and played your blues way better than the version on the White Album. The problem with having such a stacked bill is that the night ran really, really late. The Stones themselves didn't go on until almost four o'clock in the goddamn morning. They played Parachute Woman, No Expectations, Sympathy, and, uh, with one more big thing on the agenda. They're debuting the material for the next album. That's right, the Rock and Roll Circus was supposed to be the world premiere of You Can't Always Get What You Want. The guys are visibly exhausted, but Mick pushes them through and delivers one of the funniest things I have ever seen. Try sometime. Well, you might just find And you might just need Despite all of the backbreaking work that went into organizing and executing this thing, the rock and roll circus didn't see the light of day for many, many years. Why? Well, out of 15 hours on set, they only got about an hour of usable footage. Since the Stones were so tired and probably a little high when they played, uh, they weren't at their best. Plus, another band stole the show. The Who quite literally played the best a quick one while he's away they ever played. So the stones just looked like ass in comparison. And that's the release of Beggar's Banquet, the Rolling Stones getting consistently outshone by everyone. Uh, before I move on to my review of this thing, there was a very special song shopped around during Beggar's sessions that I didn't talk about. It was called Blood Red Wine. It eventually became winter on Goat's Head Soup. So, what do I think of Beggar's Banquet? Going in, I'll admit it's been a long time since I've listened to Beggars. Aside from the hits, I might have only listened to this thing once before. To begin with, this is the last time we can really call Brian Jones a major player. He was a complicated guy, a deeply flawed man, but I adore him. I really do. I wish we'd gotten just one more album with him at the height of his satanic majesty's power, but I'll accept this. On Beggars and let it bleed. We are hearing the soundtrack of the twilight of a very young man's life. It's haunting. The MVP of Beggars is Jimmy Miller. He took a fractured, disorganized band and in this weird counterintuitive way, totally reinvigorated them by stripping them back. The other MVP is Keith Richards. For a couple years in Stone's history, as Brian was checking out and Mick T was not yet around, Keith's pulling a double shift, playing both rhythm and lead. With these two albums specifically, Beggars and Let It Bleed, anyone could argue, yes, Keith is talented, and yes, he can be disciplined when he wants to be. Otherwise, he's getting arrested and snorting his dad's ashes, kicking things off with woo woo. This is one of the best songs the Stones ever recorded. The rhythm section is stacked and really does most of the legwork for the song. Charlie got that. 
by playing a hand drum with a set of sticks. A mixed tom-tom is layered over top. Nicky Hopkins on piano is doing a lot of the work that a guitar might do, and Keith on bass. All of that together makes this sticky, seedy groove. It has a spectacular atmosphere. The crowd shuffling in the background. I'm pretty sure that's Anita giggling in the beginning. I feel like I'm packed shoulder to shoulder at a dinner party from hell. And if Anita is there, that must be where I am. Cheers, bitch. And then the host reveals himself. Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. This may be one of the most compelling sets of lyrics we've ever got from the Stones. The devil taking charge of his own narrative, painting himself as a refined gentleman more than a literal actual demon. He says he's not a force of evil, but more so a trickster god who shakes things up when necessary. He proudly admits to everything he's done from tempting Jesus to riding a tank into the Blitzkrieg and everything in between. But there's a catch. Just as every cop is a criminal, facts, and all the sinners saints as heads is tails, call me Lucifer. Basically, he's saying if you need a fucking villain, then so be it. But I'm human like you. You see, we carried out these acts together. We killed the Kennedys. For there to be good in this world, there has to be a little bit of bad. And though the devil may pull the strings, it was us who listened. Mick, ever the showman, embodies this character with a refined ferocity. There's a strange lightness about no expectations, a breath of fresh air after sympathy. We step out of the crowded, sweaty party to have a smoke. Airy vocal and breezy acoustic guitar bolster the listless feeling Mick sings of. The narrator is a man who's gained and lost a lot of material things in his life and isn't too acclimated to being attached, let alone to his mercurial love. You throw your pearls at swine, and as I watch you leaving me, you pack my peace of mind. It's a slightly bitter way of saying I haven't slept since I last saw you, and we made too many memories for me to ever come back here. Brian's slide part here is minimal but lovely. Nikki drops in some gorgeous open piano chords. If my championing of You Got the Silver and Winter are any indication I love a good Romantic Stones deep cut. Dear Doctor is just kind of here, I guess. You gotta laugh at the boys' mock country accents, especially Keith on Bear in that jar. We're a little stoned and giggly with a harmonica. Mix falsetto playing this guy's woman is pretty funny. But for a filler track, the ascending acoustic finger picking part is unreasonably good. I completely forget about Parachute woman. It's a gritty, bluesy lo-fi number. I wouldn't be surprised if this was one of the tracks Jimmy built around a pre-existing demo. That drum and rhythm guitar track is straight up crunchy. Then you get this very metallic sounding harmonica. It's mic'd so hot, I feel like I'd get zapped if I got too close. Good thing I am wearing my rubber soles. Valuable life lessons from Professor Keefe. I love Jigsaw Puzzle. It's kind of of the story of the Rolling Stones so far. I don't think I've been able to properly shout out Bill Wyman in any of my Stones videos so far. This might be the best bass line he ever came up with. We really get to appreciate it when it's this far forward in the mix. The drums slowly build, an angular acoustic guitar and squiggly slide from Keith. He wrote something really cool here. Bass and a Mellotron made to sound like a chorus of recorders, which is just delightfully stupid. As the tramp, the bishop's daughter, the outcast, the gangster, and the drummer join the party, we get more instruments. Aside from Charlie clearly being the drummer, I wonder who everyone else is supposed to be. I didn't notice Nikki in the mix until the last 30 seconds, even though he's been here for the past three minutes. Then we get into soldiers and pissing off the Queen of England and 23 
thousand grandmas. On a scale of one to Bob Dylan, we have Bob Dylan level of characters in this thing. If I had to pick one song to illustrate 1968, it would be Street Fighting Man. This is another great Mick performance. I can just picture him flailing about in his little booth as he slings out the lines in that defiant sneer. Summer's here and the time is right for fighting in the street, boy. I think the time is right for a violent revolution, but where I live, the game to play is compromise solution. 68 was the year the summer of love bled into more violent means. I'm not as familiar with what went on in the UK at this time, but here in the States, we had the assassinations of MLK and RFK and the DNC riots that year. We have another lo-fi moment. The mic was pretty much shoved inside the guitar to get that iconic tinny sound. And Charlie's on an antique drum set. That's how we get that almost big band boom. I love the eclecticism of this track, the sitar and tambura buried deep in the mix with a whirling spinning piano over it. This was the atmosphere Brian brought. It was something ephemeral, but oddly grounded. The sound of the Shanae makes me wish we had Bobby Keys wailing on the sax, but he hadn't entered the picture yet. You know, just like I really wished the single version of Honky Tonk Women made it on to Let It Bleed, I wish we got Jumpin' Jack Flash on Beggars. It fits with the atmosphere so well and would have made a great counterpart to Street Fighting Man. Prodigal Son is a venture into the black spirituals tradition. Mick is doing his best impression of a Delta blues singer. He lifts some of this stuff right from Robert Johnson. The Rolling Stones and controversy go hand in hand. Enter Stray Cat Blues. Oh man, I am viscerally uncomfortable. I wish you could have seen my first reaction to this song. It went a little something like, ah, 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 I was putting away dishes and I threw a fork. For a split second here, I thought we were gonna do some Doors backdoor man thing with that opening bass line, but Jimmy said he was inspired by VU's heroin for this one. Stray Cat is a lot less noisy, but has a similar insidious vibe. You know, the more I think about it, the more sympathy for the devil might have been the perfect thematic opener for this album. We're having a hedonistic banquet with Lucifer. Here on Stray Cat, the narrator invites this little girl in for a banquet upstairs. Looking at these lyrics, I like to think of it as a character song because it's just so creepy. Even creepier when the I see that you're 15 years old line was changed to 13 on Get Your Yaya's Out. Like, I think people miss the point that we're supposed to be repulsed by this narrator. Uh, this is the big bad wolf luring Little Red Riding Hood in. Is it weird that Mick here reminded me of the way Courtney Love sings. They have the same half talk, half groan. Uh, I could imagine a Courtney cover of this and it would be great. Factory Girl. What an intriguing combination of stuff. A mandolin, a fiddle, and a tabla. I'd never think to put those three things together, otherwise it's just kind of here. And lastly, Salt of the Earth, a proto you can't always get what you want. It's slightly less composed, but the seed was definitely planted here. Like Sympathy, Street Fighting Man, you can't always get what you want a little later. Uh, Salt of the Earth exemplifies why Jimmy and the Stones worked so well together they knew how to build a song. We kick things off with acoustic guitar in the front and electric lurking in the back. Keith sounds almost meek as he calls for a toast to the downtrodden and weak. The chorus rounds out the theme from the beginning of the record, raise your glass to the good and the evil. Mick joins in, then the bass, the drone held on the low end creates this gorgeous depth. Uh, this might be my favorite Charlie moment on the album and I can't 
quite explain why. Is it the fills? Is it simply to hear him doing his thing? Halfway through, the choir kicks in. It's less bombastic and more sublime. For the rest of the song, we go full gospel. Play us out, ladies. Beggar's Banquet is the stones crashing back down to Earth after a couple years in space. We have gone from the loftiest of highs to subterranean lows, finally come down from the acid we'd been tripping on for two years. But in my eyes, we kept all of the most magical things about that fever dream of a record. We kept the occasional zaniness and the communal feeling, plus we have this new country direction that the Stones will only dig their teeth further into. It's a fantastic display of a rock-solid rhythm section, highlights everyone's talents, whether their stars are burning bright or just about to burn out. The Stones are masters of tension and energy and at the height of their power once again. Beggar's Banquet is an eclectic, earthy, earthly delight. My personal favorites on this one are Sympathy for the Devil, No Expectations, Jigsaw Puzzle, and Street Fighting Man, with an honorable mention for Jumpin' Jack Flash. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that's it! That is the 55th anniversary of the Rolling Stones Beggar's Banquet. What do you think about this album? What do you think about the Rolling Stones? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums that I love. And remember, despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. If you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Or will I? Bye!